Good morning, Nigeria. Thank you very much for joining us on this morning's edition of Breakfast Central. It's a brand new day, a brand new morning, and a brand new week. A lot happened over the weekend. Whilst a number of us were busy celebrating International Women's Day through different forums and different activities, uh, it was also a very sad weekend for Nigerians and, uh, of course, the family in particular of Herbert Wigui, who unfortunately passed alongside his wife and his son. Now, the burial ceremonies happened over the weekend and several dignitaries all flew to River State, uh, Port Harcourt, to show their respects and to be there in order to honor his life, his legacy, and to be able to be with his family as they laid him to rest. Unfortunately, whilst uh, this was supposed to be a solemn ceremony that honored his life, politicians decided to make it an opportunity for them to politicize the affairs of the day, which is something that... Nigerians have frowned at. You know, it's, we find it quite baffling that politicians will not cease to use any and every opportunity to address their beef. From Fubara talking about, uh, uh, sort of saying that, you know, this is not a political, no, he didn't say it wasn't a political message. But he addressed politicians, basically letting them know that, you know, you, you can't take all of this anywhere. You, you basically shouldn't try to help people. You know what? I wouldn't say what happened. Let's take a video clip and listen to exactly what was said by our politicians. What is all this struggle all about? This one has to do with our political class. What is all this struggle all about? You want to kill, you want to bury. Well, that was of course uh, the governor of River State, uh, Governor Simnalai Fubara. He wasn't the only one who sort of made a political statement. We also did see Senator Goswil Akbabio share some sentiments regarding some of the statements that were being made by Governor Seminalai Fubara. It has been a political tussle back and forth between these two big weeks. And, you know, Nigerians have asked, couldn't you have shelved your political differences at least for one day to honor the life of Herbert Wigui. If you knew you had key burning issues that you wanted to talk about, you probably should have organized a press conference and invited the media to give you an opportunity to air your thoughts, but not at a ceremony as, you know, as sobering as that. You should have, you know, given him his last respects and not brought politics into all of that. But the whole of Nigeria stood still as he was being honored and his body was being laid to rest. It was a sad time for the Herbert Wigwe family as well as you know, the family of the Access Bank. So just to say that we share our thoughts and our prayers and our condolences with all that have been mourning the, this great uh, monumental loss. It is something that our nation probably cannot get over. It's such a huge loss and we extend our prayers to him. So much happened over the weekend. Uh, we're going to be looking into the stories. Last week also, unfortunately, there was another attack. Bandits did attack in Kaduna. We'll check to see what the updates are regarding that story. Before we get into the big stories today, let's share with you what our top stories this morning are on Breakfast Central. Wigway's burial, of course. Politicians fight dirty during the burial, which is something that we've talked about, but we'll talk about some more. Senate queries three trillion naira additional budget. What does this mean? Are we still talking about budget padding in 2024? And the President Tinubu set to launch students' loan scheme on Thursday. What exactly are the details and is this something to be excited about? We of course will look into the newspaper front pages as we review some of the big stories. All these and more on Breakfast Central. But first, let's bring you breakfast headlines. Hello and welcome to Breakfast Headlines here on New Central TV. I am Adebola Adebola. We're beginning in West Africa where an unknown number of persons have been trapped in a five-story building which collapsed while under construction in the commercial city of Onicha, Anambra State. It was gathered that the building, meant to serve commercial purposes on completion, collapsed in the early hours of Sunday while some of the construction workers were on the last floor. An excavator has quickly been moved to the site to begin the evacuation of rubbles and rescue operations of any trapped victims. The reason for the collapse has not yet been ascertained. 
the Danagandi Electricity Distribution Transmission Solution Station, rather, located in the Kano Municipal, has been engulfed in flames, sparking concerns and disruptions in the power distribution across the region. Owned by the Transmission Company of Nigeria, the Danagudi station serves as a crucial hub for transmitting high tension electricity to numerous substations throughout the metropolis. The cause of the devastating fire remains unknown, leaving authorities and residents alike grappling with uncertainty and potential disruptions to power supply. The federal government has placed a ban on leave of absence for health professionals relocating abroad. The Minister of State for Health, Sonji Alausa, said that health workers going abroad to seek greener pastures must henceforth resign their appointments before embarking on such journeys. The minister who spoke during his visit to the neuropsychiatric hospital, Arrow, said the directive was contained in an executive order issued by President Bola Chinobo. The presidency has vehemently refuted allegations of budget pardoning of the 2024 fiscal year dismissing claims made by Senator Abdo Ningi of Bauchi Central as unfounded. Senator Ningi, representing the Northern Senators Forum, accused the executive branch led by President Bola Chinebo of implementing a budget that exceeded the approved amount by an additional 3 trillion naira. And now to security updates. A joint tax force comprising personnel from various security agencies has dealt a heavy blow to the activities of the indigenous people of Biafra from the front lines of security operations in Imo State. In a statement issued earlier on Sunday, the director of defense media operation, Major General Edward Buba, revealed that the recent operation faced significant challenge as the fighters had cleverly concealed their hideouts amidst dense foliage rendering them nearly invisible to aerial surveillance. The South African president and the president of the ruling African National Congress, Cyril Ramaphosa, has met with his supporters in church in Ekunhuleni. South Africa will hold a legislative election on May 29 amid high unemployment and widespread disillusionment with the ANC, which has been in power since 1994. And Chad's junta appointed Prime Minister on Sunday said he would contest the May 6 presidential election eight days after incumbent Mohamed Idris Debney Ito announced his candidacy. Former opposition leader Success Masra returned from exile and joined Debbie Itno's team to become Prime Minister this year. The opposition says his candidacy is a ploy to give an appearance of pluralism and a vote the junta chief is setting to win. And that's all on Breakfast Headlines. It's back to Olive. Adebola, thank you very much for bringing us Breakfast Headlines. Uh, so many stories there give me cause for concern, chief of which is the building collapse in Anambra State. Now, the reports have it that the building started to collapse from the fifth floor. They were just putting finishing touches to the fifth floor and then it crumbled all the way down to the first floor. And now there have been reports of people trapped in the building. Now, this gives me cause for concern because this will not be the first time at Ebola that we're seeing building collapses, not just in Anambra State, here in Lagos State. Uh, we've seen different parts of the country where building collapse had bec has become the order of the day. And, of course, there are several reasons, from the quality of the materials that are being used to mainly the fact that we don't see adequate investigation being done such that uh, those who are in charge of the properties that collapsed are made to face the courts, you know, made to face the law, to deter further uh, builders from ensuring that they, you know, they do not use substandard products. So I feel that if we have seen litigation in time past where property managers or you know, the building contractors have been made to face the courts, go to jail for their building collapsing and killing people, especially when they've been found negligent, we will see, we'll see uh, less repeat of such incidents, don't you think, Debola? Rightly mentioned, Olive, it's one incident too many. Uh, the repeated cases of building collapse in several parts of the country is just quite worrisome. Uh, like you rightly referenced, you talked about Lagos State having a high number of collapse, you know, of buildings. It's just a cause for concern. Um, I think the whole chain, uh, the whole team, when it comes to the architect, the engineer, and even those who are supposed to grant access or licenses for the construction of this building should be held uh, accountable. Uh, talk also about the material, like you rightly mentioned, the quality of material used in building the structures. All of this chain or lineup 
have to be looked into critically to ensure you know where exactly things went wrong and also like you rightly also said uh all if there's a need for us to prosecute uh you know hold to account anybody found defaulting so to serve as you know a deterrent to other people who may want to go into such thing yeah. uh construction of building requires a lot of diligence you know, we're talking about lives here, lives lost in the Absolutely. process I mean, of collapse. Even the integrity of the foundation of buildings must be interrogated because there have been many cases, we've seen them happen here in Nigeria, where they've gotten approval to build a one-story building or they've gotten approval to build a, yeah, maybe one-story building and then they end up building five-story buildings. You know, at, at the end of the day, of course, you will expect a collapse because the foundation was not adequately prepared to carry the weight that has been put upon it. And the then... Foundation yeah, yes, ahead. just to butt in there, Olive, what bothers me again is who gives approval? Who are those in charge of giving approvals for buildings to say, okay, this is good to go? I think that office needs to be looked into because we've seen too many cases of building collapses here and there, not just in Lagos State, which has a high number, by the way, but also in several parts of the country. So who gives approval for buildings to be erected in, in Nigeria? That office ought to be thoroughly investigated. Of course. Um, so be, beyond uh, the approvals being given, one thing we've also talked about is the fact that it's not just giving a one-off approval. It's having periodic uh, inspections. So you've given this approval, the building, uh, the construction has commenced. It's important to visit the site and ensure that things are going as planned. So routine inspections will be able to prevent things like this from happening because when you do a routine inspection and you get there, you realize that this building had an approval for yeah. one floor, one story, and then it's ended up becoming five stories. Mm -hmm. Then somebody has a question to answer and that building will be demolished not even, they won't even give them a chance, it will be brought down. So until we start seeing stiffer measures being employed to ensure that we curb building collapses, and even people reporting, there's some houses that you would see and you ask yourself, how is this house, first of all, still standing? Mm. How is it still standing? Because you can see how very thin the house is. You can tell that the house is not sturdy enough. You can see the cracks on the wall from the bottom to the top mm. and you're, you're concerned. So. I think that individuals also have a responsibility to start to report when you see properties that uh, the building is, you know, the, the integrity of the building is being questioned or, is, you know, is questionable. It's important to report because you are saving the lives of people by doing so. But let's go away from that and talk about the budget, allegations of budget padding. Uh, hmm. Does that come as a surprise to you, Adibola? Is it a surprise to me? I mean, Nigeria is fraught with one issue over the other, creeping up or coming up every single day. I just feel we need to look beyond the benefits of the office, the advantages being in position comes with, all of the, you know, advantages, benefits you get from being, you know, in the helm of affairs and get down to doing the business of the day, which is to serve the people, the dividends of democracy. So talk about the issue of budget parting. I feel a budget, a uh, pardon rather, I feel, uh, those at the corridors of power should actually use monies allocated for the right thing. Uh, purging, I mean, padding of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the budgets here and there, allegations here and there, would do Nigeria you know, no good. We've seen people coming out to deny the allegations, saying there was nothing like uh, budget padding, the monies sent were actually the monies needed for certain activities or certain offices in Nigeria. I just feel it's high time. Nigeria at this point in time is dealing with a lot. We're grappling with a food crisis, food, insecur food insecurity at 35%. We have inflation to grapple with at 29%. We have escalating prices of goods and services. Queues you see in filling station. The price of gas has skyrocketed. I just feel it's high time. All of those in power get their act together. Very true. And uh, away from Nigeria, finally, let's head to South Africa to see what exactly is happening with uh, Cyril Ramaphosa. I find it quite interesting. Of course, he's campaigning for re-election. Now, his time in office has been fraught with a lot of allegations of corrup corruption. Uh, looking at uh, the uh, Pala Pala uh, farm gates scandal, which many were surprised that he got out of and surprised that the ANC threw their weight behind him. And now he's campaigning for re-election. The ANC as a party in South Africa is one that has been uh, accused not just of corruption, 
but they've been accused of trying to subvert justice. Uh, they, they've been said to be a very incompetent party. A number of uh, South Africans have said that. And some would say that uh, if uh, Nelson Mandela were to see the ANC that is today, he would, he would be very grieved and upset at what it has become. Uh, so it's very interesting to see, you know, the turn of events. And uh, we're counting down to elections in South Africa. I think it's in, on the 29th of May, I believe. Uh, we're counting down to elections. Uh, we'll see how things turn out for him and for the people of South Africa. It's a bit shocking for me, though, having delayed the election and then he comes out to be part of those, you know, contending for the election or contesting. Uh, one of the reasons he gave earlier on was the credibility of those running for office of the presidency in South Africa. And then you turn around to now be part of those still vying for office beats my imagination. But hey, yeah. like you say, let's wait and see. May 29 is the D-Day. We'll just have to wait and find out and see what these holds in stock for South Africans and also for Africans, you know, for Africa at large. We'll see what that holds in stock. Well, for to our us. South African audience, we wish you all the best. And let us know what you're thinking. What's the line of your thinking as you count down to the elections? Are you excited about the ANC's government? Are you excited about Cyril Ramaphosa? And uh, what are some of the things that you're expecting regarding the election? Uh, are you expecting to be free and fair? Just share with us your general thoughts about the forthcoming elections in South Africa, as well as the strength, the credibility, and the popularity of the ANC as a political party in South Africa. Adebola Adedigba, thank you very much for joining us. It's always a pleasure to have you, and I look forward to uh, having you join us again at 9 a.m. to bring us the news. Good to be here. All right. Uh, we will, of course, we'll go on a break, and when we come back, there are many stories we're going to be looking at this morning on Breakfast Central. Please don't go away. Back to Breakfast Central. If you're just tuning in, uh, please remember to join us on social media at uh, New Central TV on all platforms. Now, we'll be uh, talking about the proposed budget, but just also highlighting some of the surprises, you know, that happened over the weekend, which we did talk about earlier. And, you know, I'll be bringing Joe in on this one. Joe, talk to us about your thoughts uh, regarding the budget. Uh, were you surprised to see those allegations? It was, it was shocking, I must say. I don't um, think it was shocking. It, it, was, it, it was over the, week, over the weekend, um, Senator Ningi uh, did come out, uh, granted an interview to the BBC in Hausa, and then he made mention that what they had already um, approved, uh, approved uh, turned out to be something else. And then they do not know where the extra you know, budget is going to. So he had said that it was 3 trillion naira. That was added that they approved 25 trillion naira. However, um, the senior um you know um assistant to the president did come out to say that it was 27 that was indeed approved and aside that they are now pointing fingers back to the national assembly there's a national assembly that added a 1.2 trillion naira to the um, annual budget so we're, we're starting to see a case of back and forth but then again i think we should help nigerians understand what the story truly is um, I mean, following accusations from Senator Abdul Ningi of Bauchi Central PDP that the executive is implementing a budget other than the one approved on January 1st, 2024, the presidency has denied allegations of padding the 2024 budget by an additional 3 trillion naira. Uh, what you see there on the screen is a message coming from the um, State House. Um, 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 that's from the State House, from the SA or SSA to the president. But then again, um, Senator Ningi, um, under the edges of the Northern Senators Forum, had alleged in an interview that the federal government, led by President Bola Ahmed Tinubu, was executing a budget significantly higher uh, than what was passed by the National Assembly. Absolutely. Senator Ningi said uh, a 25 trillion naira budget was debated and passed not the 28.7 trillion naira that is currently being implemented. He said, and I quote, apart from what the National Assembly did on the floor, there was another budget that was done on the ground which we didn't know. However, in a statement signed by the President's Special Advisor on Information and Strategy, Bayo Onanuga, the presidency described Ningi's claims as false, asserting that Tinumbu had initially presented a 27.5 trillion naira budget to the National Assembly, Assembly on the 29th of November, 2023. He said his budget included 9.92 trillion naira for recurrent expenditure, 8.25 trillion naira for debt service, and 8.7 trillion naira for capital expenditure. Contrasting Ningi's claims, 
stating that it was impossible for the Senate to have debated and passed a 25 trillion naira budget that was never presented. This morning, we're joined by Parliamentary Advocacy Network National Public Secretary Dominica Lancha. Uh, good morning, and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me, and good morning. Uh, Mr. Lancha, first of all, I think the first question will be to ask you to share your thoughts with us regarding budget padding. This is not the first time that we're hearing about budget padding. It's something that has been recurring <clears throat> in past administrations. So does this come as a surprise to you? Well, um, this does not really come out as a surprise to me uh, because if you look at uh, the National Assembly, I think uh, uh, the issue of budget padding actually came to public glare uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in, the, in the Eighth Assembly. You know, when uh, Dogara was the Speaker of the House of uh, Representatives and uh, uh, the Chairman of uh, the Appropriation Committee, uh, Honorable Abdul Mumimi, raised the issue of budget party. And uh, what I ordinarily expect us to do at that time as members of civil society is to actually wake up and interrogate that issues. Uh, of budget padding, because you see, that is where Nigerians are a bit on change. Nigerians are a bit on change because the responsibility of the National Assembly is actually to perform oversight, you know, uh, appropriate. And it is as a result of that appropriation that they padded the budget, you know, to suit their own personal interests, you know, to, you know, to enrich themselves and all of that. So for me, it doesn't really come to me as a surprise. But there is need for Nigerians to really, really wake up and interrogate this issue. This is not an issue that would just be swept under the carpet. As, advoc as parliamentary advocate, we are going to ensure that we push it out there so that Nigerians will really know the kind of leaders they elected to represent them at the National Assembly. Leaders that will come, you know, and not, you know, uh, push the interests of Nigerians, you know, issues that will bring about the development of Nigerians, but their own personal development, personal aggrandizement, I think it is unacceptable. Nigerians should wake up. How can, I mean, it's unheard of. An individual, part of the budget of set of individuals, you can see that some of the leadership of the National Assembly are already coming out to, you know, to defend it. And that is to tell you that it's a cohort, it's a conspiracy against the Nigerian people. You know, they are coming out to say, no, this doesn't happen. Uh, I had the other day, the chairman of the finance committee, uh, honorable, I mean, Senator, Senator Sani Musa, coming out to say that nothing like that happened. How can you convince Nigerians that nothing like that happened? And recall that the budget, when it was sent to National Assembly, there were issues. Some were saying it was an empty box. Some were saying that they don't even have access to the budget. I mean, so in a democracy, this cannot be allowed to continue to happen. So we really, 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 really need to interrogate these issues. Nigerians need to wake up to interrogate this issue and see the end of this so that pardon can be, you know, can, can be nipped, nipped on the board. Pardon can be buried once and for all. This is one right. of the things that we must wake up at this time. We cannot allow individuals, individuals to pad the budget to the tune of four trillion naira. Haba, did you want to say, did you when you say that we need to investigate, the way you say that we need to interrogate, who do you want to investigate and interrogate? Can the House investigate itself? Do you trust the House to be able to conduct a panel to investigate itself and, uh, you know, bring out an honest report? Well, advocacy group, you know, need to come out. We, we have the freedom of information. Advocacy group need to come out because these people do not have integrity. Nigerians do not trust them. You can hear the response of Akpadio that this could have been done when he was hospitalized. I mean, who does that? In, in a sane society where the system is functioning, where the system is working, how can you say that the budget was padded when you were if, if That is an admittance or, already in itself. How can you admit, say that the budget could have likely been padded when you were in the hospital, when you were hospitalized? So we do not trust them to do that. The presidency on their own part can set up a committee 
to interrogate the issue of budget pardon, to interrogate that issue, for them to come out and be dis uh, and be defending it that the budget was not padded or something like that, I think it doesn't make sense. So there is need for us, you know, as members of civil society, as National Assembly, you know, parliamentary advocates group to begin to touch light that area and then bring out, you know, some of the issues that has been raised. For example, the Northern Senators are also saying that uh, the, 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 the budget, the, the, the 2024 budget is lopsided. In other words, the North has been shortchanged in that aspect. Could it be because the North has been shortchanged, you know, or they were not carried along? That is why they are bringing out all these issues. These are issues we really, really need to interrogate. And without that, and people can also go to court. And Thinking of avenues where we can exploit the judiciary in, you know, uh, 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 in, 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 in unveiling some of these issues, you know, so that Nigerians will really know what is happening. But bottom line is that the kind of leaders we have in National Assembly are not leaders we can trust. They cannot be trusted, and we must, you know, uh, do something about it. All right, Mr. Lancha, um, I just want to quickly read a tweet that um, uh, was made by. Uh, the uh, by Mr. Bayo on Nanuga. And this tweet, I'd like you to react to it um, in line with this because you have said that Nigerians need to really react. But let's hear your thought. Um, he did make this statement in a tweet. He said, and um, I quote, um, contrary to the strange view expressed by Senator Ningi, there was no way the Senate could have debated and passed a 25 trillion naira budget that was not presented to the National Assembly. So he's saying that it wasn't 25 trillion naira that was uh, uh, presented to the assembly. And then he made a very, very critical statement in which uh, many Nigerians are wondering how possible is this? All right. Um, he did say, uh, I beg your pardon, I'm trying to ensure that I look for that tweet. He said, in the spirit of democracy, which allows give and take, give and take. President Tinubu didn't withhold his assent to the appropriation bill as passed by the National Assembly. I want to stress that if the budget figure was increased and made to be different from what the executive proposed, it was the National Assembly that jacked it up in exercise of its power of appropriation. What do you have to say about this? Well, that is a confirmation that that uh, 2024 budget was actually padded. Two things there that are take, that are take, that, that, that are take away from me. Number one, in the spirit of give and take. Number two, it is the National Assembly that jacked it up. That is the pardon we are talking about. Pardon is to, you know, to, to, to add what was not there or to bring fictitious figures that was not there. That is the pardon. So it's alluding to the fact that really the budget was padded. And I think it is a shame that we are talking about, you know, budget padding at this material time. And those budget padding, like you can hear, there was no, there was no budget, uh, you know, a project attached to it. It was a fictitious thing. It is it done with the intention of defrauding Nigerians. Nigerians should wake up. Members of civil society should wake up. Patriotic Nigerians should wake up and see how we can nip this padding to the, to, the, to, the, to the we can nip, nip it on board. So it is unacceptable. So Bayo Onanuga is confirming to Nigerians that the budget was actually padded, padded and they are aware of it. That is why he said, in the spirit of give and take, Mr. President did not withhold asset. I mean, who is where he can't fool us, please. Okay. Mm. Uh, we have a minister of uh, budget and economic, uh, economic planning that. Uh, uh, Abu Bakr Atiku Bagudu. Uh, what would you say his role is in ensuring that we don't uh, see a repetition of conversations like this? And what can we do to prevent these from being a cycle that reoccurs every other time? Because it seems that with every new administration or every new year, we're hearing about allegations of budget pardon. It's getting quite exhausting. So what, what can we do to ensure that these do not become... Uh, I mean, it's become the norm now, but that we stop it from being the norm. Yeah, to stopping it from being a norm is what I'm saying, that we need to really wake up and, you know, ensure that our we, we touch light our budget. You know, um, to be honest with you, I, I must say this at this material time. I have my reservations uh, when uh, Bagudu was appointed the Minister of Budget and uh, National Planning. These are people that kill the economy. If you look at this history from the days of Abacha, 
you could understand that he was not free from corruption allegations and all of that. And these are people you are bringing to, you know, to man our economy, to be in charge of. You cannot give a lie on God's to keep for you. He will eat it up. So it's unfortunate that somebody like Atiku Babudu is a minister of national planning where you carry the resources of Nigeria and put in their hands to oversee, to legislate, to allocate, and all of that. They will do it the way they want. And, you know, Nigerians, we must wake up. If we really want to stop these things, it is citizens' actions that will bring about, you know, uh, an end to this budget pardon. If Nigerians will wake up today and take this issue seriously and protest and occupy National Assembly so that the truth can be known, subsequent, you know, budget will not, you know, we will not be hearing these kind of stories. So citizens should wake up. It is time for us to take our destiny in our hands by Mr. ensuring that, you know, these resources are equitably distributed and not distributed into the pocket of who is who, or who, 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 who is who, some of these uh, national people that so-called leaders, you know, that we have in our country. It is unacceptable. So citizens should wake up if we really want to nip it on board, if we really want to see the end to budget funding, we have to wake up. It is citizens' actions, you know, that I'm calling Mr. for Mr. to Lancha. ensure that we nip this budget pardon to the board. Mr. Lancha, I mean, you, you've mentioned that citizens need to wake up. Is it the same <coughs> citizens uh, that had cried foul uh, when they saw in the budget about how much was uh, allocated for a yacht? And they said there's no such thing as a presidential yacht, but then again, they let it slide. The same um, people you say should wake up uh, did also see about how much, about 1.5 or so trillion now that was allocated to the office of the First Lady, and they let it slide and nothing happened. How certain are you that they would not let this one slide? Because as it is, it's like it's already been approved. Honestly speaking, this government is a listening government. Uh, President Asuadu Bola Ahmed Tinibu is someone that listens. If you recall, during the yacht issues, uh, they responded and they clarified Nigerians. The yacht is not the presidential, uh, it's, something, it's not something that belongs, you know, exclusively belongs to the president. It's just a name that was given to the yacht. It's something that belongs to the Nigerian Navy, but they call it presidential yacht. It's just like when you go to, you know, five stars hotel and they tell you presidential suit. Presidential suit does not exclusively belong to the president. If you have the resources to, you know, to occupy that suit, you can occupy it. But you see, I'm not defending the government. What I'm only calling on is that citizens, we need to wake up to engage. We need to offer our participation. We need to demand for accountability from our leaders. We have leaders who have elected to represent us. We need to hold them to account for, you know, our, 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 our resources within their disposal that they are allocating or appropriating or legislating over. We need to really wake up and hold them. Just to just to clarify, uh, Mr. Lancia, you're, you're saying that you <coughs> believe that this current administration has all that it takes to be able to nip uh, the situation in the board, to be able to conduct um, sufficient investigation and uh, make people answer, make those who need to answer answer the law. Is that, is that what you're saying? Please, can you come again? Are you saying that you have... Uh, okay, I, I guess I'll just ask you directly. What are your thoughts on this administration's ability to investigate this uh, allegation properly? I mean, they've come out to deny, but do you have confidence in the leadership of President Bola Metinubu and his administration that they would actually take co into consideration <clears throat> all that has been said and actually do some investigation? Seeing as they've already come out to deny it. I, I have I have hundred percent president on the administration confidence on the administration of uh, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu, you know, to fight corruption because this is corruption. You can see, you know, previously, you know, the the the, the, the allegations that were raised about you know corruption, you know, uh, against officials. We saw the actions he took. He suspended the Minister of Humanitarian Peter Edu, you know, who legislates, you know, uh, a substantial amount of. Uh, resources to ourselves, to our pocket. And then we saw the suspension just recently, uh, rural electrification, uh, DG, and some executive directors were suspended. You know, these are things that uh, 
that that investigation unveiled, and at the end of their investigation, you know, they they they, they suspended. No, so I, I just want to, uh, permit me to butt in. Permit me to butt in, uh, Mr. Lancha. Permit me. Permit me to interject. To permit me to interject at this point. Because at the start of this conversation, and for the most part of this conversation, you've expressed displeasure um, as to how this affair has been run. You, you, of course, believe that the budget was padded and that you have asked Nigerians to stand up and demand for their right. Will Nigerians Absolutely. need to stand up to demand for their right if the government and if this admin administration does what it needs to do and conduct an investigation? This is the administration that already has released a statement saying that they, uh, the allegations are false. I mean, you're saying on the one hand, Nigerians need to stand up and fight for their rights. But on the same breath, you're also saying that you believe that this administration has what it takes to be able to conduct an adequate investigation. I don't know. Help me understand. Now, now if, you, if you talk to people on the streets, if you talk to people on the street in the past, they will tell you that there is no need for their action because government will not do anything. No. What I'm saying is that we need to wake up. It is as a result of our, you know, first for demanding for accountability that will push the government to do the needful. And I'm saying that I have confidence on the leadership of President Asiwa Jubola Ahmed Tinubi because he's a listening president. He's someone that wants to listen to what Nigerians are saying. He's someone that wants to listen to the issues that are out there. And I have confidence that if Nigerians will wake up to demand for accountability, if Nigerians will wake up to demand for investigation into this budget padding of four trillion naira, the president will give him and ensure that there is a thorough investigation into it. Perhaps that budget was padded without his knowledge. You can All hear right. by Ononuga saying that in the spirit of give and take. What do you mean by the spirit of good give and take? What do you mean by they jacking it up? Is it their responsibility to jack it up? It's not their responsibility to jack it up. It is the responsibility, it's exclusive responsibility of the legis the, the executive. And that is why we have a minister of budget and national planning who will send to National Assembly for them to look into it right. and then appropriate accordingly. So right. Nigerians right. should have confidence cool. that if they wake up, Mr. 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 Lanza, thank you. We want to thank you so much. Like we we want to thank you so much. We do not wake up. There thank is you. Thank for you for your points, Mr. Lanza. Thank and you. I'm saying but that we... Nigerians should be confident that if they wake up to demand, Asiwa Dubola and Metinubu will do the next All right. Thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Dominic Alancha. We look forward to have you again. Hopefully, uh, we do know that this is an unfolding story, it's a developing story, and um, possibly today, uh, we look forward to get a response from the National Assembly, and we know that you have been covering National Assembly. You will be able to uh, join us again um, very soon. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I have a good day. All right. Let's move on now very quickly and tell you that the special advisor to Nigerian President Mohamed Tunibu on media and publicity, Ajirin Gilali, says... The president will launch the student loan scheme on Thursday, March 14, 2024. That sounds like pretty much good news. Well, on June 12, 2023, if you recall, Tinubu signed the Access to Higher Education Act 2023 into law to enable indigent uh, students to access interest-free loans for the educational pursuits in any Nigerian tertiary institution. The move, according to the presidency, is a fulfillment of one of his campaign promises to liberalize funding of education so this seems to come at a good time when the economy isn't looking too well, good we just you know, have to wait then... till the 14th of march because this is not the okay, first I'm time talking we've... too soon right yeah exactly let's just wait until it's actually implemented because uh <laughs> there are promises of it being implemented in january nothing happened mm -hmm. february nothing mm -hmm. happened and now we're in march right yeah. so it's been a long time coming let's wait i, I don't want to count my eggs or you know before i actually i, been I agree with you i see listen i i accept what you've said because we talked about this last week that we have to be very careful whatever press release we see or hear and a lot of people i mean with due respect to the uh, special advisor to the president um many have started to see that the words that come out from that aspect or from them you cannot hold it you know hook line and sinker you just have to ensure that is it true or not you have to wait till it happens there's an there's, a, there's an african proverb i don't know you i agree know. Then I, th I believe it's a Nigerian proverb that mm. says that there are some people that when they greet you good morning, you have, have to, to open the window that. to check to see is it really morning. And so I hope that our so president hasn't become... We we'll, we'll actually wait we'll to, see, to wait to see exactly to see what happens to it. Whether this promises will materialize. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Yeah.
Anyway, it's been um, one hour of um, stories and, of course, conversations. Let's quickly bring you a recap of what we've discussed so far this hour as we look forward to the second hour with a lot to discuss in focus. Exchange of words at Weigwe's burial ceremony. We, we did talk about that. Oliver, I saw you had that conversation Absolutely, as well with them. I did. I mean, the, it's very sad. Well, uh, presidency yeah. hits back at Senate over additional budget. Of course, Bayan Onuga has denied. Uh, that's the presidency have denied. And uh, President Tinubu said to launch students' loan scheme on Thursday. Fingers crossed. Uh, let's see whether this actually manifests. But let's share what's coming up next on Breakfast Central. We'll bring to you the newspaper front pages, which kicks off now. You can be part of it, and you can call in as well. And concerning the Jaguar federal government bans leave of absence for health workers, nobody will be allowed to take leave of absence anymore. Olive, can you beat that? I can't. <laughs> we'll talk about that in a moment. Welcome back to Breakfast Central. Now, it's the point where we get to hear from you. You become a part of the conversation. As we analyze some of the big stories this morning on the front pages of the papers, we're joined this morning by public affairs analyst Dotun Ojong. It's always a pleasure to have you. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Monday to you. Happy. Ah. <laughs> oh, we keep forgetting you. Oh, no. <laughs> there's an, the an in-house joke. For those who worry and wonder, what is it? What, what makes these people laugh every time they say happy Monday? It's because there's this unspoken rule that when people say happy weekend, they're expecting you to drop some money. Yeah. And we've been waiting for you to come on the show on this Friday so we can tell you <laughs> happy weekend. Happy weekend. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's look at this Nigeria and see what's happening in this Nigeria. On the front page of this Nigerian newspaper, Senate to debate alleged 1.2 trillion Naira 2024 budget padding tomorrow. <laughs> we are not involved, saying, says the president. So that means my hand didn't do. <laughs> 30 trillion naira ways and means. <laughs> Prosecute Buhari, ex ministers now, indeed. Lawyers, CSOs urge Tinubu's administration. Ex president can be jailed if found guilty, says Ozeko Men. Palano, Tinubu lacks political will to try him. President was part of Buhari's failure, according to Adewurua. Military killed 20 IPOP fighters, destroyed 50 hideouts in Imo, according to the defense headquarters. Jakba, federal government prohibits. Leave of absence for health workers. Um, with health salaries, SSANU, Nasu begins seven-day warning strike <laughs> March 18. He's like, the strike is back-to-back. -back. One minute, we, are, we have a break. Every other day, an organization is going on strike in Nigeria. All right, and the final story this morning on front page of this Nigeria. Blocking phone lines of Nigerians over NIN slash SIM linkage. Unlawful, says Sarah. We'll come back to that, but of course, I want you to react to the burning conversation of the Senate debating the alleged 1.2 trillion Naira 2024 budget padding. I'm sure you're not surprised by that. Your, um, budget padding really in Nigeria has been apple torture because um, if you do not pad budget, it's going to be exceedingly difficult, if not practically impossible, for you to get the money spent on election. So it's not for those who are surprised I think it's because of the fact that um, they've not been in that corridor. They don't know what it means to win election in Nigeria. They don't know the expectation of the community from their um, uh, rep representative. And they may not also know the level of our greed as a people. Now, it's a bit outrageous when you're talking in terms of trillion now. And I think that's where the worry is. But again, I will not be surprised in the course of the week for uh, the senator who made uh, this allegation to come out and say, oh, I actually apologize because uh, you remember that maybe also the Senate president listened to too much of David O's song when he said 30 billion was, uh, who was actually mm. paid <laughs> to governors. And he came out to say, oh, uh, it's actually a mistake. So I would not be surprised if um, in the course of this week, um, the senator comes out to say that um, it was um, actually a ruse. So that's it. It's not surprising to people like us understand the process of governance in Nigeria. The, the, there's one critical statement that was made in um, Bayo Nunuga's tweet that Nigerians are really reacting to. The fact that he said it's about give and take. Nigerians are reacting to that statement in a, in, a, in, a, in a negative sense, especially online, and saying, what do you mean by give and take? If XYZ was approved for the fiscal budget, why is it that if there was any padding, 
and then fingers are being blamed on who did this, who did that. Why is it that it came out now? So there's a lot of conversation around it, this that people still cannot fathom that it will take place in a time when Nigeria is going through very tough times. Lot. Um, that's one of the um, major issues you have when you have a core politician rule you at every point in time. The greatest strength of President Tinubu is the fact that he understands the system. And that is also his greatest win. Because when you, he, he, he came out to say that this is his lifelong ambition, he missed that. He has actually uh, met with a whole lot of people that are presently in power. So when majority of these people make mistakes, when majority of these people are caught in corruption, it becomes difficult for him to actually stamp his feet on the ground as the CEO and the, C, um, the chief security officer of the state to say that this is what we want to do. So give, give and take is always very pronounced when you have a core politician as the leader of your nation, the leader of your party. So that's, that's, that's the meaning. It means that when the Senate commits a crime, the presidency may actually look away from it because in the process of the installation of those people who formed the leadership of the Senate, the politician was actually prominent. The politician was nominated. The politician was going all around to ensure that his candidate win. I do not think that we should be too surprised to have seen that um, release or that tweet to say, oh, um, it's give or take. Though it offends the sensibility of corporate communication if you understand how to pacify people in time of crisis. Uh -huh. um, he just spoke. He just spoke like a politician. All right, let's look at the big story here. Talking about the thirty trillion naira ways and means. Prosecute Buhari, ex-ministers. Now, um, ex-president can be jailed if found guilty. Says Ozekume. Uh, is, I wanted to. Uh, I don't even know how to ask you this question. But do you ever see the possibility of President Muhammadu Buhari being called to ask answer questions and being made to face the law? Um, let's just look back. Uh, we don't need to open the book of philosophy or psychology. We just look back into history. And the question is very simple. Has How it ever happened? How many of them has ever been called back, even when all fingers point to the direction of President Gula Jonathan? President Gula Jonathan gave orders to the National Security Advisor, release so, so so amount of money, release this amount of money. And in government, there are two uh, places where you run to when you need urgent money. You run to the security budget because nobody gets to scrutinize it you run to information budget because, as it were, you cannot measure the extent at which money has been expended on these two areas. So when the president says, oh, madam, go to the national security advisor, take this so-so amount of money. And at the end of the day, nobody is able to ask the president question. We took the national security advisor to jail. You all know the story. So, and now we have a Buhari who I want to believe gave order to a Mephiele to actually do most of the things he did. See, the CBN governor reports directly to the president. He can do anything. In fact, we have seen in this nation that the, the CBN uh, uh, governor decided to change the color of the Naira without the minister of the economy, the coordinating minister of the economy, being aware of what he's doing. So if we have a CBN governor who is dashing people money, who's done all those things he has done, and everybody is keeping quiet, and we want to send the man to jail. What stops us from asking questions as to who sent you? And you ask the man who sent him, why did you do this? But again, we are not seeing it happening because APC will not gang up against APC. In fact, even if it were another party, I doubt whether we will ever call any president to question in Nigeria. It's, it's, it's a tough one, yeah. no doubt. Very yeah. tough a situation we find ourselves now because... Um, everyone is calling for the president to be prosecuted, even his ex-ministers. Um, I just want to quickly highlight here that even one of his ex-ministers who had spent a lot of trillion naira or trillions of naira uh, to bring about the Nigeria's first flight carrier, um, he's still lounging somewhere, relaxing, talking about Hadi Sirica. Yeah. And nothing, nothing, even though a report came out that uh, his brother was a huge benefactor of the fund as it was traced, according to the EFCC. But yet, it's so shocking that the EFCC, all of a sudden, did not grow wings. Can I quickly just tell you something, the... please? In government in Nigeria, there are four uh, major um, factors that determine the duration of any government in Nigeria. The first one is competence. The second one is character. The third one is incompetence. Now, listen to the fourth one. The fourth one is body language. 
Now, body language is more important in these four components. In fact, body language has the power to overshadow the level of your competence. They can appoint you as the chairman of an agency. You come with all the energy, and body language prevents you from working. So once we get to a point, body language is a stopper. Body language has the capacity to just stop anyone. So at the point we are now, I think we are at the point of body language. And everybody is looking to the direction of one man, president. the president. If he gives the green light, we see that people are competent in Nigeria to do their job. Mm -hmm. Body language. All right. Okay. You can actually uh, be part of the uh, the conversation on the front pages. You can call the number on the screen. Just go ahead and dial. And we look forward to hear from you on the Monday morning what your thoughts simply are. And talking about what your thoughts simply are, let's check out the next uh, front page of the paper. And we're looking at the Vanguard. Very, very exciting times here in Nigeria. That's what we get to see. And that front page indeed says it all. The Vanguard says businesses suffocating as energy costs shoot skywards. Businesses are suffocating up 41% to 635 billion. Its second biggest problem after Forex, Muda Yusuf. Um, high energy costs crippling operations, says Okumu Oil MD. 98% rise in our selling distribution expenses due to diesel cost, Boa Food says. Implement Power Sector Eligible Customer Initiative, ex man boss to federal government. Operators blame low generation as rationing persists nationwide. Um, I think I'm starting to know when I do have power in my home. Um, it comes at a certain time, stays for a certain uh, minute or hour, and then it's gone. And then we wait again till the next time. Hunger. If federal government fails to secure farmers' food, prices will remain high. Fakan says. And um, uh, let's, let's, let's just focus on this one concerning power. It's, it's been a back and forth. We did see the Minister of Power, Adibai Adilabu, of course, aside from having his power bank, he did also announce that they would indeed revoke licenses. And a lot of people said that's a good way to go. But then again, business owners are the ones who are feeling the brunt. And they're the ones coming out to say, this is where the challenge has been. Boar food has increased. Even the snack that we get on the Express, the small snack that we yeah. buy in traffic, no. It's now 150, 200 there. I mean, your thoughts on this? It, it's uh, ridiculous. And I'm wondering why uh, Muda Yusuf decided to put uh, this uh, behind um, um, Forex. This is actually more important than Forex. Because for you to bring down, to add value to your Naira, you need to produce. Nobody can produce in an economy where there's no power. I tell it to you today, 200 million people, we need like 50,000 megawatts of electricity to be able to power our businesses, to be able to create something out of our life. In 2014, the World Bank insisted, 2014 or 2015, that for any economy to grow, we need to pay deliberate attention to MSEA, the small and medium scale enterprises. And how do we survive in Nigeria today without electricity? How can small businesses, for those of us who have opened shop and closed it, we know, the, we know the impact of it. It means that the young girl that you employ goes back home. And all of these have an effect on, the, on a poverty index. And it's been said over and over that once a nation, a community dips further into poverty, insecurity increases. So we we'll continue to see situations where kidnappers are running on our street. Because if you do not tackle the issue of insecurity, which also is a product, security generally, we can talk about food security, but how do you want to have food if electricity is a challenge? Mm. I tell you that why everybody is concerned about the cost of petrol today is because we lack electricity. If reasonably we can actually have electricity, then you can decide to take your petrol to, 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 to any amount of money you wish. But our life today is tied to petrol because electricity is not there. And we continue to see all of these things. It's when you say uh, the concept of change in leadership, the concept of change is disruption. But you do not embark on radical change, except you have identified the most important point in people's life. When this president came aboard, he embarked on radical change. Oh, we are taking off subsidy. We are, we are, we are, we are working on the Naira and all of this. He should have declared a state of emergency in electricity. 
then people will take him more seriously when they can get home on their power and there's power. It's not as if your president is not working. Your president is working hard, but the people are not seeing it because the intensity at which he's working is not commensurating with the intensity of the poverty that the work is producing. <laughs> so when the president says he's working, the people are saying, we are not seeing it. The only thing we are seeing is poverty. But if the state of emergency had been in power, nobody would be able to. If your president dismantled all of this, President Gula Jonathan, one of the major mistakes he made was to have signed this bogus arrangement with Jenko or Disco or what do they call them. If he had come to say, oh, we are actually revoking the licenses, everybody would have sit tight at, at the moment. Permit me to digress. You see the level of insecurity increasing gradually. It is to test the president's capacity. If he doesn't respond appropriately, we will be in trouble. And that's the same thing that happens in power. When Buhari came on board, President Buhari came on board, the first two weeks, it, it was as if he did a magic. There was stability of electricity. Suddenly when they knew that oh, Baba goes slow, no, nothing's going to happen, everybody just reverted to status quo. The art of leadership is to create a path, no matter how difficult it is. Bring the people along with you. Shut up the mouth of those people who do not want you to perform. And create a better community for everyone to, to live in. That is I'm yet to see. It's, 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 it's I don't know if you saw the video of well. uh, Governor Alex Oti you know. walking the streets and uh, his citizens were all hailing him. Everybody was excited. And what that tells us is that as a governor, when you work, you don't need to hire a PR company mm -mm. to do your publicity mm -mm. Yeah. for you. You don't need to. In fact, your, your media advisor has little or no work to do. Yeah. The people will sing your praise because action speaks for themselves. People are seeing the working of Governor Alex Oti. So, of course, the citizens are happy. The citizens are praising him. He doesn't need to talk too much. It's action. So, yes, I completely agree with you in the area that if our government has prioritized electricity, a huge number of our problems would have been over. A huge, the ease of doing business. Our ratings will rise on the, uh, you know, the ranks of ease of doing business in Nigeria because a lot of businesses, it's part that is eating into their, their, their even, money. Even as individual, your creative ability is on a very high side when, when you see electricity. Mm -hmm, of Sometimes you just want to write, you want to walk, <laughs> but you can't do all of this in darkness. Or when they are past my, pass my neighbor generator is, is ringing noise. in your head. So I think it's, it's an issue of parity. And talking about uh, governorality, I think one major thing that all of us must take away from that is that perception before performance, credibility before you do anything. This government in Nigeria today, the major issue that the president Tinubu has is the fact that the people in the community do not believe him. Yes, that they trust, do not believe the, the government. They do not have the something. trust in the government. Yeah, that trust deficit. And this is a major that thing that the government about. must work, work, work on. Yeah, the trust deficit is, you know, it spreads across the board. But we'll come back to talk more about this. We'll go on a very quick break. When we come back, we'll be looking into some more stories, and we want you to call and be a part of the conversation. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Breakfast Central. If you're just joining us, well, we're almost done with the newspapers, but we do have one more, one more paper to review. We're joined by uh, Dotun Ojong, who has been very helpful in reviewing some of the big stories on the front pages. It's always a delight to have you join us. It's a pleasure to be here. All right. And just to mention that if you'd like to get your thoughts across, the numbers to call out your TV screen, the phone lines are officially open. Please call in and share your thoughts on any of the stories that we're going to be discussing this morning. Um, I don't know if we have any more stories Absolutely. to take on the front page Absolutely. of The Punch before we go uh, to the uh, next paper. I think let's just, just go to The Punch. Let's okay, all right, great. Let's punch. go to The Punch newspaper. Yeah. Um, and on the front page of The Punch newspaper, the big story says, schools in 14 states, FCT risk attacks, says federal government. Adamawa, Bochi, Boronu, Katsina, FCT, others affected. 465 pupils, women in kidnappers' den, Federal government receiving U.S. support to free victims. Presidency alleges sub-regional forces behind kidnapping. That's a lot. That's a lot. Let's also take um, some more before we go back to that story. Um, this one says, Ogun police nab three for murder attempt. You can see their picture there on page four. Those three um, uh, young lads who are seated on the floor there. Uh, okay, I think the two boys and a lady. Wow. Blackout worsens as hoodlums vandalize transmission line. Mm. 
Okay, and um, uh, oil earnings rise by 450 billion in two months, according to the federal government. So that means they have more money uh, to do more work and to alleviate uh, the sufferings of Nigerians. But let's take your, let's have your take on the warning from the uh, from the federal government about uh, more schools to be attacked. Yeah, insecurity. You know, I quickly just mentioned it the other time that any time you have situations like this, that um, usually insecurity. Um, rises, the level rises. But let me tell you that most of the things you get to read are what I call political insecurity. And that's why when you become the president in a peculiar nation like ours, I must mention at this point that there are people whose agenda is that Nigeria will never move forward. These people are scattered across political parties. They are scattered across religion, um, religious practice. They are scattered across ethnic groupings. And once a president comes in, have you ever wondered why um, during election, the level of insecurity always goes down? But immediately after election, when a president or somebody emerges, you just discover that before you know it, all of these things will start again. It's usually a fallout of election. But again, the box stops on the table of the president. This is not the time to be sipping tea. Honestly, if, the, if President Tinubu allows this rascality co to continue for additional one month, they will make this nation ungovernable for him. This is how it started. You know, it started with uh, people kidnapping themselves yeah. in the Northeast. And one of the security strategies that we got, that got leaked, was the fact that President Gulo Jonathan told them, okay, since they are in the Northeast, ensure that you cage them to the Northeast. But in our own very eyes, they came to Abuja to bomb the UN house. So now it's spreading gradually. This is how banditry spread to the North Central. And before we know it, our kings are being killed in the Southwest. So it is a test time for President Bola Abed Tinubu. And if he allows these things to go like this, anybody that needs to be picked must be picked. Anybody that needs to be questioned must be questioned. Anybody that needs to be arrested must be arrested. You, you, you remember the conversation we were having some time ago that when they arrest kidnappers and they put them on television, you don't get to see the trace of fun in their body. It shows that there are always big men behind the scene that are causing this crisis. Men that have decided to make Nigeria ungovernable. And it is the duty, it is not my duty, it is the duty of the president. Enough of what we do, we will do, we will do. I think we are used to what we do. Let me tell you why there's, apart from what he did or what he did not do, let me tell you the, why we have this level of trust deficit in government. In psychology, there's what they call uh, internally generated data. That is, when they give you a particular information, a piece of the information stores in your head. Now, when they give you another information that pertains to that subject tomorrow, before you react to it, you, your brain calls forth the last thing that happened. For instance, I was in secondary school. President uh, Obasanjo in 1998 said that, oh, if he becomes president, that a, a, a particular brand of vehicle may be sold for 50000 It was on the front page of Tribune. In 2002, you know, as a boy, I, 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 I took that in. In 2002, um, former Vice President Atiku said that, oh, once we pri uh, privatize, that all these agencies will, be, will, will begin to work. I took that in. In 2007, um, um, the president then, Umar Musa Yadra, said he was going to declare a state of emergency in power sector, and that will lead us to having electricity. I took that in. And since 2011, when any government comes on board, makes any promise, I judge them based on the information that from I have internalized. Great. Let's take this call from Lola, calling from Abuja. Good morning, Lola. Uh, please go ahead with your comment. Good morning, and how are you? Are you there with us? Good morning, and how are you? Very, very well, thank you. Please go ahead. Thank you. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I totally agree with your guest. I think for the first time, I hear somebody speaking the clearest truth ever. The reason why a lot of things happen in this country are, is because of those people in those different sectors, religious, political, ethnic, that do not want the progress of this country. And I hope the president's advisors are listening to him because if, uh, if he doesn't need it in the board now, a month is even too much, sir. 
they will make sure that you and I don't walk freely on the streets of Nigeria. So I believe that if the presidency, our president, and I know he's capable, should it's he, he, not the time to sip tea, like he has said, is the time to I mean call to action. We know there are people who don't want this country to move forward, but Nigeria is the only country we have. And as patriotic Nigerians, Nigeria must work, irrespective of who is the number one or a citizen of the country. And I know that President Gola Ahmed Tinubu wants Nigeria to work. Thank you very much, uh, the gentleman. Thank you very much, Lola, for calling. Lola completely agrees with you mm. about the fact that a number of Nigerians, a number of people don't want Nigeria to work, and she believes that President Tinubu wants Nigeria to, Nigeria to work. And, you know, saying that it's a call to action for the presidency to step up its actions uh, to forestall these, you know, other people who, who are, you know, trying to frustrate this administration. Yes. Yeah, I believe. Uh, from one administration absolutely. to the other, you always have this set of people who just, uh, who are head bent that things must not work. But it's actually the duty of the government president. to put, nobody can be more powerful than government. Nobody, except if you want to lie. But again, sometimes it may not be legal. Your action may not be legal. That's another aspect of governance. Your action may not be legal to tame these people, but it may be logical. So we have to open our books and look at the names, look at what we can do. What is logical. What is logical and, and what is not. Yes. Anyway, I move thank on. you. Thank yeah. you so much, um, Dr. John, for always being here. Thank you for your time. And uh, we hope to have you on a Friday, <laughs> if possible. We'll try this Friday. <laughs> we must. If it can't work, then we'll just keep saying uh, <laughs> that. Uh, what's that word again? Happy, happy, happy Monday. Happy Monday. Happy Monday. <laughs> happy Monday. <laughs> Stay with us. When we come back, uh, we'll take a look at another very interesting story. If you're a medical practitioner, the government has placed a ban and it has been enforced. Well, you might want <music> Nigeria's Minister of State for Health, Dr. Tunji Alausa, says that the federal government has banned leave of absence for health professionals relocating abroad. Health workers going abroad to see greener pastures must henceforth resign their appointment before embarking on such journeys. The minister said the directive was contained in the executive order issued by President Bolamed Tunubu and emphasized that it was done to combat the challenge of brain drain fondly called the Jaqua syndrome confronting the health sector. According to him, the annual enrollment of nurses, which used to be about 28,000, had been increased. To 68,000, adding that by the end of the year it would have gone up to 120,000. The president has also ordered massive recruitment of personnel to bridge the gap of the shortage of manpower in the health sector. Joining us this morning to discuss this is the Director General, West African Institute of Public Health, Abuja, Dr. Francis Ohaindo. Good morning, sir. Thank you very much for joining us. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be on the All right. Uh, we would like to find out what your thoughts are on this move by the federal government. Um, is this something that maybe, is, is this a perfect time? Is it a great move? And is the timing right for this move as well? Okay. Um, thank you very much. Let me first start by saying Nigeria is in, in dire straits at the moment. And uh, uh, certain decisions have to be made. But we need to also make those decisions uh, carefully. And they must be stakeholder driven. When decisions are made uh, in such a way that there appear to be uh, gaps between the stakeholders and the stewards of the system, then uh, there may be challenges. Uh, yes, the government uh, is in, in a place where it needs to begin to stem the, the, the tide of uh, Jackpot syndrome, as you call it, uh, in terms of healthcare workers' uh, migration in and out of Nigeria to other places, call it greener pastures or or places where they get better sense of uh, self-actualization of what they think their medical practice is going to be like. Um, but the thing is this, um, we we need to ask ourselves what are the reasons why people need. Uh, uh, fundamentally, I think the, the, the first thing to note that why people need is because they want to, like you say, self-actualize, get a better life for their families and all that, you know. So, but if they're in employment of the government, yeah, so it may be a bit uh, frustrating for government to know that its citizens are leaving while they are still answering that they are staff of the government. That is understandable. On the other hand, people also leave for extended leave, uh, what you call leave of absence, because of uh, studies. 
But one of the things that happens with that is that they are bringing more skills or better skills to the health system of Nigeria. So this is something that the government needs to weigh very well, you know. Although some people have abused it in the sense that they have abused the extended leave thing, the leave of absence thing in, in, in some dimension where they just use it, keep their names on the road of government and leave permanently without even saying bye-bye in any form. So that itself is an abuse of that practice. But in itself, it's a practice that is important for skills acquisition and also for technical know-how for the system of Nigeria. So the government needs to sit back. While it's going to implement this, it needs to begin to think about how it can get the benefit of stakeholder input into it in a way that is wholesome and does not create observations that will be raised at the international level of organization. Because this is very important, because uh, this, this issue uh, uh, can also be played into the realm of even burnout, mental health, and also the issues of human rights. So government needs to be very careful as he, it implements this policy moving forward. It needs to be stakeholder-driven so that it doesn't find a situation where Nigeria is in front of the international labor organization defending some of the observations made on this issue. Um, Dr. Hainido, well, in one of the uh, comments uh, made by the minister, he did say this, and I quote, it is a free world, but you cannot eat your cake and have it. If you're going to uh, just resign your appointment with the federal government rather than applying for a leave of absence. So it seems that this is coming from a back heel of seeing a lot of doctors that have jackpot, permit us to use that word in this um, context, and have done this on the pretext of, oh, I need to take a leave of absence. So the government is simply saying, if you need to go, you can go, but you will no longer do this. You've said that they need to be very careful if they're trying to implement this. But my question in all of this is, how careful can they get? Do you think this will stop the health or medical practitioners from leaving the shores of Nigeria? Okay. So thank you very much for bringing that. Uh, I agree with the minister. You can't, uh, Dr. Lausa said it right. You can't have your cake. You can't eat your, you, know, you can't have your cake and eat uh, you, that you say, you can't eat your cake and have it. Have it, yes. Yeah, which is very, very important because uh, uh, that's why I said some people have abused it. The original idea behind it was to, to strengthen the idea of global south development in terms of the south, getting the benefit of the new house of the north. So people go abroad while they are serving the ministry or working in government uh, hospitals or, or, or facilities to be able to acquire more skills and more knowledge. But people have abused that. What the government needs to do is actually to put in place mechanisms that are, that that actually is that tracks and monitors this movement and how some of these uh, recruiters get into the Nigerian system and see that okay, even if they are going. There has to be a mechanism where government is, is, is acknowledged in this scheme of things. Because if you really think of it, a lot of us that went to school in Nigeria, especially in public sector, uh, uh, got trained. We, took, we almost, we almost uh, got that education for, for uh, free, freely, if you, if you think about it. Some of us that went to school in government settings and all that. You find that in government schools, our education was quite cheap. So we have to be concerned about this migration. But like you say, I agree with him too, is that it's, it's a free world. But implementing this in itself has some ramifications on the health system in terms of quality of care. It has ramifications in terms of the sense of self-actualization within that system. If you're working there, you can feel frustrated that you don't have the opportunity to go abroad. And then you're wanting to work for government. You ask yourself, why would I want to keep working for government if I can't even go and develop my skills elsewhere? You know? So government needs to have this as a stakeholder-driven uh, this, and it should not seem to be targeted at a particular profession or professional group. It should be seen to be something that is holistic. Because people are living from tech. The banking sector is suffering because of tech migration. People are living from other industries, you know. So it's not only help. So if you are going to do this, let it be holistic. Let it be seen to be stakeholder-driven. And let there be certain, uh, certain uh, what we call it, uh, signposts within the system and guardrails around it that helps make the people who work within the system to understand that you're doing it for the benefit of the system, not just trying to implement a strict public policy in the country. 
That is what I'm saying. So I basically agree with him that things need to be done. That's why I started by saying that we're in a dire street now in Nigeria, both economically, both living migration in terms of our best brains are living. We need to be very careful how we go about putting policies in place. That's All right. the main point. Okay. And whatever policy we put needs to be stakeholder driven. Very important. All right. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Francis Ohaindo. I mean, we, we just wanted to hear your points concerning this uh, particular situation. Mm -hmm. And we do hear that there would also be um, a process that would need to be taken in order for this to be implemented. Hopefully, when we call you, uh, you'll be more than willing to join us once again. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. All right. Let's take that break. When we come back, it's Which Way, Nigeria? The 10th of March 2024, we celebrated Mother's Day. Now, I'm not yet a mother, but I'm not unaware of the huge sacrifices and responsibilities that role comes with. As many women shared posts on social media about motherhood, some said it is the most challenging yet rewarding role that they've ever taken on. There's nothing quite like the love of a mother. I heard women yesterday share about what motherhood means to them and how gladly they would give up their lives for their children if they had to. Such love. So imagine for a moment. Having all that love in your heart and having it snatched away, ripping your heart into shreds because bandits kidnapped your children. It's not fiction. It's the reality of Nigerian mothers, especially in northern Nigeria. Ever since the most widely publicized kidnap of schoolgirls in Chibok, Borono State, which led to the global Bring Back Our Girls movement, abduction of students from schools in northern Nigeria have become a grave cause for concern. On Thursday, the 7th of March, 2024, bandits reportedly invaded government secondary school and LEA primary school at Kuriga, Kaduna State, shooting at their victims before taking away at least 280 of the pupils and teachers from both schools a day before Mother's Day. Now, this unfortunate incident happened barely 24 hours after insurgents abducted 200 internally displaced women while they were fetching firewood in the bush in Ngala in Borno State. All of this happening in March, the month where we celebrate International Women's Month. A number of these women are in the IDP camps in the first place because of the insecurity challenges that have led them to flee their homes. So imagine fleeing one's home to go find safety at an IDP camp and then being kidnapped at that IDP camp. Double wahala. The rise in kidnappings not only inflicts unimaginable trauma on the victims and their families, but also undermines the fabric of our society. It erodes trust in our institutions, disrupts economic activities, and feels a pervasive sense of insecurity that hangs like a dark cloud over our nation. Speaking of trust, the governor of Kaduna State Governor Ubasani assured citizens that his government will ensure that the abducted pupils returned unhurt. Whilst we hope that these words ring true, do the citizens believe him? Do they trust him? We have seen a repeat of same scenario, even as past abductions remain unsolved, and strong decisive action is yet to be taken against these kidnappers. Who are these kidnappers? How is it that they are able to kidnap over 200 students without being caught? Why do we have these repetitive cycles of kidnapping? Will these kidnappers be caught and dealt with? Will these innocent Nigerians return home alive? When will kidnapping come to an end? What is the value of a Nigerian life? As we think about all these, I want you to spare a thought for the mother of Ahmed, a pupil who during the most recent Kaduna school attack sustained gunshot wounds and was rushed to the Berningwari General Hospital and was reported dead. I want you to spare a thought for the mothers who spent Mother's Day in tears, confused as to whether or not their children will return home alive. I want you to spare a thought for the Nigerian mothers who have lost their children and their husbands to kidnappers, the ones who are currently in the IDP camps because of insecurity, the ones who are running around trying to secure a ransom for the release of their loved ones, even though they cannot afford to feed. Nigeria cannot continue to fill them. Nigeria must prioritize the safety and security of its children, its women, its citizens. It is not a happy Mother's Day until mothers no longer have to fear for the safety and security of themselves, their children, their spouses. No, it isn't. Reports this morning on the front page of the newspaper have it that schools in 14 states and the FCT risk attacks. The point further reports that 465 pupils, women, in kidnappers' den. Mm. I rest my case. Good morning, Nigeria.
very sad situation there. While many were celebrating Mother's Day, some were mourning. Very, very sad. Well, we've come to the end of Breakfast Central on a Monday morning, and we have indeed covered some of the biggest stories that you should know. Tomorrow will be another day to keep date with us. But in the meantime, New Central has a lot to bring to you later in the day. My name is Joe Hansen, by the way. And my name is Olive Emodi, and we'll see you tomorrow.